So I'm going to read a little bit about the sincerity and the uh, incredible uh, endeavor that Bodhisattva was undertaking. But just uh, before that, so the prince left the palace. It's really interesting, I think, to understand that as the prince was looking at his wife and his newborn son, uh, my father, you know, he complains and said, oh, about this Buddha, he like, walked down on his wife. I'm not sure about this Buddha bloke, he said. <laughs> well, when he was looking at his wife and, and his son, and when he decided to go and strive, what he was looking for, of course, was the deadness. So an intuition that the Bodhisattva had, which is not one that everyone has, this is coming from his you know, eons of cultivating mindfulness and reflecting, and uh, his very sharp intuition. And he, he had this insight that because there is death, there must be the deathless. Because there are conditioned phenomena, there must be an unconditioned, but he hadn't realized it yet. So when he's looking at his wife and his son, and he's aware, because as the legend goes, the driver took the Bodhisattva out of the palace, and the king had kept sick, old people out of the palace, because the seer had said uh, when the Bodhisattva was newly born, he had such remarkable faculties, so beautiful to look at, so radiant, gold complexion, and this uh, asita, a kind of a sage a reader of physiognomy it's called looking at the signs and characteristics look at this baby and he said wow because the king wanted to know what this what this sage had to say about his son and so that sage said your son is either going to be a wheel turning monarch so that means like a, a leader of the world or a truly profound renunciant summoner one gone forth. And so the king thought, well, I want him to be a wheel turning monarch, I don't want him to be an ascetic. So the king tried his utmost, the legend tells us, to have the prince entertained with every type of refined sensuality and to keep away sights that would lead to any feelings of sobriety or introspection. So sick people and old people weren't allowed in the palace and the prince was surrounded by young, beautiful people. I think even the dead leaves were taken off the trees before they, you know, because only allowed to see uh, life and abundance. He had a summer palace and a winter palace and a rainy season palace, different lotuses in each palace. So anyway, I'm not sure if that's all true, but we can deduce from that that certainly the prince had a very luxurious life and that the king definitely wanted him to be uh, a king, a great king. But when he, he had this uh, spiritual urgency and this uh, reflective nature, so he wanted to bust out of the palace, basically, and so his driver did let him out. And he saw on consecutive visits a sick person, and he'd never seen a sick person before. He said, what's that? And the driver said, a sick person? And he says, Am I subject to that? And he's trying to say, yeah, yeah, we all will be sick at some point in our lives. And so it's said that the vanity of health disappeared, that the prince no longer took for granted the fact that he would always be healthy. And on another visit, he saw an aging person. He'd never seen an old person, so he saw a stooped over person. And he said, what's that? Is that an old person? He said, am I subject to that? And the driver said, yes, we'll all get old. And then another visit, according to the legend, so a dead person, a corpse, it's a corpse that. That's, that's a dead body. He said, well, that happened to us. Said, yes, that happened to us as well. And then another visit, a little bit outside of the palace, he saw a summoner, a wandering homeless one. He said, what's that? That's a seeker of truth who's left home. So he had, had these visions you know, back to the palace and these things kind of woke him up from the sleep of, and the distraction of sensuality. And so uh, 
you know, one one day he just decided if I'm subject to aging, if I'm subject to sickness, if I'm subject to death, it's like a prison and uh, we're all sentenced to death, we're all sentenced to sickness. And he's looking at his wife and he's looking at his son and he's thinking, there must be something better than this. And he had that, that inkling, if there is the condition, all of these conditions, birth, aging, and death, there must be an unconditioned. If there is death, there must be a deathless. And so looking at his wife and his child, he's thinking, I want to realize that so that I can teach it to others. Basically, he wants to bust out of the prison and he wants to break the door of the prison so that we can all get out. So he's with that profoundly compassionate intention that the prince leaves the palace and then as the story goes he trained with the very best meditation masters of his day and it seems that he had very sharp spiritual faculties because uh, he was studying I'm not even sure when he developed the first fourth jhanas but his first teacher was teaching him the uh, fifth and sixth jhanas and the second teacher taught him the seventh and the eighth jhanas. So according to what Ajahn Anand tells me about the current masters in Thailand, even the Arahants, most Arahants have up to the fourth jhana. You need the fourth jhana, which usually happens after the, somewhere between Sotapanna and Sakaragami, you need the fourth jhana, which is a state of pure equanimity, to kind of starve the latent greed and hatred by being equanimous with phenomena and contemplating it and with great mindfulness. But it's that fourth jhana which um, Buddha sometimes talks about a green stick. A green stick won't catch light, but he says a dry or a dry log placed on dry land will catch light. So it's this, it's this fourth jhana, this pure equanimity which dries out the tendency to greed and hatred, just being able to observe phenomena without liking or not liking, and bringing that, uh, you know, composed, uh, well-trained awareness and collectiveness to see phenomena with equanimity and the attachments, liking and not liking, fades away. So anyway, current arahant beings with no greed, no hatred, and no delusion have that level of concentration and there's only a few people left in the world that have these jhanas which the Buddha had trained in and perfected before he was a Buddha. So it's just getting a sense for what a remarkable being this was. And not only that, when he when he attained the fifth and sixth jhanas, he had the insight to realize. So we're talking about I'm trying to remember the exact order. But it's like things like infinite base of consciousness, infinite base of space, infinite base of nothingness, and the infinite base of neither perception or non-perception. So if any of us were to experience a concentration so profound like the infinite base of space, it would be very difficult to contemplate the characteristics of such a profound and subtle and boundless thing. Now the Lord Buddha had so much mindfulness that he could see that that quality degenerated. That it was still subject to conditionality, it still arose and ceased. And so basically as profound a quality as it was, so you have to, apparently from what I found, you have to let go of the perception of the self to experience the infinite base of space. And that's what the mind's experiencing, empty space in all directions, boundless. But the Bodhisattva could see when he came out of that attainment that the sense of self came back and that the sense of space degenerated and the mind went back to a more normal state. But his own teachers felt that they were enlightened and they felt that that was basically it. And they offered him shared, shared uh, leadership of communities because basically the Bodhisattva had developed the same attainment that they had so they were offering him shared uh, leadership of the community, but the Bodhisattva could see this isn't it. This is still conditioned. And so he went on to his another teacher and, and uh, mastered the uh, infinite base of nothingness and the uh, infinite base of neither perception or non-perception. So these are just incredibly profound and subtle mind states. 
where apparently when people can enter those absorptions and stay in them for months and the body doesn't degenerate it's so it's, there's so much virtue in the mind and, and it's such a subtle thing that people can be in like the full lotus posture and enter one of those absorptions and come out a month or two months or three months later I'm talking about incredibly profound types of concentration but the body's not about noticed that there were conditions, incredibly subtle, amazingly profound conditions. And if you if you develop that type of concentration and become attached to it, you end up being born as a Brahma Deva in your next life. And the Brahma Devas live for eons. The merit of that kind of meditation produces, you know, so much good karma that you get to live in a realm which is so subtle and uh, it doesn't degenerate from that state of samadhi for a whole eon. So human beings are kind of, you know, bumping around 50, 60, 80, 100 years. And uh, these Brahma Devas, some of them uh, measure their lives in like 5, 10, or 20 eons. But anyway, the Buddha saw it, that's where it was going. He saw that it was still in samsara, even though it was incredibly subtle. So the next thing he did in his determination was his practice of austerities. When he left those teachers and he realized, no, I'm not going to share the leadership, I'm not going to pursue this anymore. So when he was practicing in his cave, and we're going to go there tomorrow, uh, he decided not to allow himself to absorb into concentration. And he ate, I think it's like one small handful of rice, and eventually a couple of grains of rice a day. And what happens is, uh, I will read it, but the skin on the front of his belly was touching the skin at the back of his belly, and the hair fell out, and he couldn't even uh, stand up to urinate without falling over. But what's interesting is, uh, you know, I'm not sure exactly how long he did this, but it was, uh, one person told me a year, but uh, one, one Buddhist scholar reckoned that because it's a six year period since the Buddha leaves the palace before he becomes the Buddha. So we don't know exactly how long he was training in those jhanas, and we don't know exactly how long he was in that cave, but he himself said that it would be possible for it is possible that other renunciants had experienced that much pain in their pursuit for enlightenment, but he did say that it would be impossible for anyone to have experienced more. So this is pretty amazing, and he has the perspective of being able to see uh, his own past lives and other past lives. So I think it's really important to recollect that the Bodhisattva was that heroic and that determined and that motivated by compassion that he basically experienced the absolute extremity of pain in his process, in his determination. And so when we go to that cave tomorrow, you can feel a different energy to the energy you can feel at the Bodhi tree. You can feel an energy of incredibly intense determination and power. And so the fact that the Lord Buddha wasn't allowing his mind to enter into absorption, what that means was that he was relying on his patience for me and determination for me as he experienced the extraordinary, racking, painful feelings. So the reason I mention this is just because when we go, it's really good if we feel, if we recognize the sacrifice that uh, the Bodhisattva made in trying to, in becoming enlightened, you know, the incredible effort, the sacrifice that, that he made for us, uh, based in compassion, then we did realize eventually that even that wasn't really going anywhere. But it's interesting to notice that His Holiness the Dalai Lama, who's kind of famous for his love and his kindness, is uh, he says that that image of the Bodhisattva starving in full meditation posture with the ribs sticking out and the stomach, skin and the back, skin pressed together, he says that's his favorite image of the Buddha. And he says it's because it reminds him that not to take for granted 
the Buddha's teachings and it reminds him that the Buddha himself was incredibly sincere and determined and it reminds him that he also should be sincere and determined in his practice. So that's just an interesting thing to notice that someone who's famous for his metta recognizes that the Bodhisattva's patient endurance and determination and effort with, uh, with great reverence. As I was saying, the Buddha recognized that that extreme practice wasn't his phrase that he that we chant in the evening chanting that the Dhamma is leading onwards. So in his striving that he, he realized, but can you imagine this, suppose he did it for a year, suppose he ate a fruit a few grains of rice for a year, a day for a year, and practiced patient endurance with the extreme of painful feelings without allowing his mind to go into absorptions, you just get a sense for how much pain the Bodhisattva put up with in trying to find a way out of the trap, you know, trying to find an escape hatch. And he was like just exploring, just patiently enduring with extreme pain, with the utmost determination and sincerity, is there a way out in doing that? And uh, he realized after a very, very heroic effort where he said it's impossible that anyone suffered more than that in striving in the whole history of samsara. Then he realized it's not going onwards, it's not leading onwards. And then he remembered that there was a time when he was a young boy when he went into an absorption under a rose apple tree when he went with the king, I think it was the, the rice field plowing festival when he was a young man, and he was just sitting under this rose apple tree and he was meditating. He, he wasn't intending to meditate because he was a young boy, but his mind went into an absorption. And uh, it was very blissful. And uh, that's obviously coming from the holy class meditations he's done in past lives, that even as a young boy, just sitting under a tree, feeling contented, the mind went into absorption. So that was the first jhana. And then he, he had that insight in the cave that there is this kind of concentration which is pleasant, but it's not sensual. And he had the insight that it's harmless. And so then he decided that he was going to allow himself to eat. And he decided that he was going to allow himself to have that mental pleasure and combine it with contemplation and reflection. So that is the middle way. So he had that insight, there is this middle way which combines a certain amount of mental pleasure and uh, collectedness with focused contemplation. And then that's what, uh, that's what led to the alignment. I just sort of give a little bit of background and uh, give a little bit of reading from the Lion Buddha, Bhikkhu Nanavali. I thought, suppose I take very little food, say a handful each time, whether it is bean soup or lentil soup or pea soup, I did so. And as I did so, my body reached a state of extreme emaciation. My limbs became like the jointed segments of vine stems or bamboo stems because of eating so little. My backside became like a camel's hoof. The projections on my spine stood forth like corded beads. My ribs stuck out as gaunt as the crazy rafters of an old roofless barn. The gleam of my eyes sunk far down in their sockets, and they looked like a gleam of water sunk far down in a deep well. My scalp shriveled and withered as a green gourd goured shrivels and withers in the wind and sun. If I touched my belly skin, I encountered my backbone too. And if I touched my backbone, I encountered my belly skin. For my belly skin cleaved to my backbone. If I made water or evacuated my bowels, I fell over on my face right there. If I tried to ease my body by rubbing my limbs with my hands, the hair rotted at its roots, fell away from my body as I rubbed because of eating so little. When human beings saw me now, they said, the monk Gautama is a black man. Other human beings said the monk Gautama is not a black man, he is a brown man. Other human beings said the monk Gautama is neither black, a black man nor a brown man, he is fair skinned. So much had the clear bright color of my skin deteriorated through eating so little. And then there's a verse. 
as I strove to subdue myself beside the broad Niranjara, absorbed unflinchingly to gain the true surcease of bondage here. Namuchi, that's a name for Mara, came and spoke to me with words all garbed in pity thus, O oh, you are thin and you are pale, and you are in death's presence too. A thousand parts are pledged to death, but life still holds on part of you. Live, sir, life is the better way. You can gain merit if you live. Come, live the holy life and pour libations on the holy fires, and thus a world of merit gain. What can you do by struggling now? The path of struggling too is rough and difficult and hard to bear. Now Mara, as he spoke these lines, drew near until he stood close by. The Blessed One replied to him as he stood thus, O evil one, cousin of the negligent, you have come here for your own ends. Now merit, I need not at all. Let Mara talk of merit then to those that stand in need of it. For I have faith and energy, and I have understanding too. So while I thus subdue myself, why do you speak to me of life? There is this wind that blows, can dry even the rivers running streams. So while I thus subdue myself, why should it not dry up my blood? And as the blood dries up, then bile and phlegm run dry. The wasting flesh becomes the mind. I shall have more of mindfulness and understanding. I shall have greater concentration. For living thus, I come to know the limits to which feelings go. My mind looks not to sense desires. You see a being's purity. Your first quadrant is sense desires. Your second is called boredom. Then hunger and thirst compose the third. Craving is the fourth in rank. Sloth and acidity is the fifth. While cowardice lines up the sixth. Uncertainty is the seventh. The eighth is malice and obstinacy. Gain, honor, and renown besides, and, in, and ill will, notoriety, self praise, and denigrating others. These are your squadrons, Mara. These are the Black Ones fighting squadrons. None but the brave will conquer them. To, get, to gain this by the victory, I fly the ribbon that denies retreat. Shame on life, here I say. Better I die in battle now than choose to live on in defeat. There are ascetics and Brahmins that have surrendered here, and they are seen no more. They do not know the paths the pilgrim travels by. So seeing Mara's squadrons now arrayed all around with elephants, I sally forth to fight, that I may not be driven from my post. Your serried squadrons, which the world with all its gods cannot defeat, I shall now break with understanding as with a stone a raw clay pot. So, pretty profound stuff. And, uh, you know, it's good, it is good to read it and contemplate it. What, what stands out to me is the remarkable clarity that the Buddha had about what the kind of forces that obsess minds and overcome minds that most people just give up the fight. And he said, the whole world with its gods cannot defeat. So, and he's, he's saying that ascetics give up here. This is the point where ascetics give up. Because all of those quali qualities, sense desires, boredom, hunger, craving, or the, the good stuff, gain, honor, and renown, deludes beings, it, just, it traps them. And so that's from the lowest hell being to the highest Brahma. Although some of the Brahmas are enlightened, actually get reborn in Brahma realms, but the ones who are not enlightened are deluded by this quality. So the Bodhisattva can see all of those qualities as Mara's forces, and he's determined to conquer them. And he says, whenever a monk or Brahman has felt in the past, or will feel in the future, or feels now painful, racking, piercing feelings due to striving, it can equal this but not exceed it. But by this grueling penance, I have attained no distinction higher than the human state, worthy of the noble one's knowledge and vision. Might there be another way to enlightenment? 
I thought of a time when my Sakyan father was working and I was sitting in the cool shade of a Rosenthal tree, quite secluded from sensual desires. Secluded from unwholesome things I had entered upon and abode in the first meditation, which is accompanied by thinking and exploring with happiness and pleasure, born of seclusion. I thought, might that be a way, the way to enlightenment? Then following up that memory, there became the recognition that this was the way to enlightenment. And then I thought, why am I afraid of such pleasure? It is pleasure that has nothing to do with sensual desires or unwholesome things. Then I thought, I am not afraid of such pleasure, for it has nothing to do with sensual desires and unwholesome things. I thought, it is not possible to attain that pleasure with a body so excessively emaciated. Suppose I ate some solid food, some boiled rice and bread. Now at that time, five bhikkhus were waiting on me, thinking, if the monk Gautama achieves something, he will tell us. As soon as I ate the solid food, the boiled rice and bread, the five bhikkhus were disgusted and left, thinking the monk Gautama has become self-indulgent. He has given up the struggle and reverted to luxury. So that's an interesting point to take note of, because those five companions later became the Buddha's first enlightened disciples. And uh, we'll read a little bit of that when we come closer to Sana. Anya Kondanya, as we chanted in the Dhammachakra, Sutta this morning was one of them. He was the first street mentor in the human realm. And uh, so that was interesting. After the Buddha did become enlightened, he surveyed the world and he was thinking, who can I teach? would understand this because what I realized is subtle and he thought of his teachers that taught him the uh, fifth, sixth, seventh and eighth jhanas and he'd seen that they'd already been reborn in those subtle Brahma realms and, uh, and uh, he couldn't teach them because they were absorbed in their subtle concentrations and then he realized now those black monks that used to wait on me they might understand this and uh, it's very beautiful that the Buddha is thinking in terms of who he can teach, who he can liberate and not thinking, you know, those guys rejected me. I'll teach them last. You know, he taught them first because he saw that uh, they had faculties which were right. So we will go, tomorrow we're going to two places. We're going to the cave where these austerities, extreme austerities, were believed to be practiced. And then coming back, having the meal, having a bit of a rest. In the afternoon we're going to go where Sujata offered the meal price, which is just after the Bodhisattva realized he needs to practice the middle way. He needs to take some sustenance and allow his mind that peaceful state and then combine it with reflection. So I think that's all I'm going to read for tonight and we'll see the actual enlightenment because tomorrow we're going to go to the austerities place and the milk rice place and then I think maybe tomorrow night we can read the enlightenment, the actual sitting for enlightenment, the experience of uh, how the Buddha combined the first meditation, the first jhana with contemplation. We would have been doing that contemplation in Upachara Samadhi, so that's uh, after the mind enters its absorption it comes out and it's very very close to absorption but it's not completely absorbed and it can it can do very focused clear reflection in that state so uh, that, that's the middle way that led, led to the Buddha's enlightenment and it's nice isn't it it's nice to recollect just how sincere and just how determined the Bodhisattva was before we go, before we head off there tomorrow. And, uh, and how much work, very hard work, and, and pain, and patience, and sincerity went into that, that enlightenment. Does anyone have any questions, comments? Is it only for Jhana, it can be for enlightenment, or do you want to for Jhana and enlightenment? Yeah, yeah, he did. So the insight was some concentration combined with reflection is skillful, it's wholesome, there's nothing plain worthy about it. But yeah, when we talk about what he was doing when he got in line, he did. And then he went into the first four jars, and then, and then he 
thinking that Uber driver Samadhi, so what that would have done, would have like charged up the mind with such an, uh, an incredible amount of power, but it's still capable of investigating form, forms and conditions. So once you start to get into the space, in, you know, infinite emptiness, neither perception or perception, it's very difficult to, I would imagine, contemplate conditions. But uh, he, he did, he went through the first four jhanas and then having charged up the mind with this incredibly powerful, pure energy and then staying in that Uvajara state, which is not absorbed, but all hindrances have been completely suppressed. It was incredible capacity to isolate phenomena and investigate. But I think he said he, he recollected 100 lives, 200 lives, 500 lives, 1,000 lives in the first watch of the night. So that's a pretty amazing thing to be able to do. And then second watch of the night, he recollected other people's past lives, 100 lives, 500 lives, 1,000 lives. So it's a very fast and incredibly focused, like a laser. I would say so too. So I think what was happening under the under the body tree was a, a very precise investigation into what causes the it's not just looking at the the details of the lives. It's a very he's like what is it? If there is birth, there must be a cause to birth. If there is death, there's a cause to death, and if there is because there is death, there must be the death. Must be looking and looking at these, like it's just looking at all those painful feelings, trying to find is the escape hatch here. Where's the chink? You know, you couldn't find it. But when he was looking at birth and death, birth and death, birth and death, where? Where's the causes? Can we undo those causes? And he had his insight that every day you can. We talk about that tomorrow night. subject in the universe. So we're very fortunate to be here, just a couple of kilometers away from the Bodhi tree, having meditated there for a few hours today, everybody. I'm just interested to know how many people can, does anyone feel that there is something special about that place? And I think that's like most people can just feel this is not, this is not an ordinary place. Something special happened here. And, uh, even non Buddhists, that's what's interesting. People who don't have a Buddhist faith, faith tell me, like, the man who went to the beach shop tonight, he tells me he, he can feel something very special about the Buddha. He likes to live here. Even his, his own faith, he believes in Allah, Allah created the world. But he can feel. He would, he would, his interpretation would be that the Buddha is an aspect of Allah and the Buddha is God as well, which is, a, you know, we would say a wrong view. But at least, you know, at least he has enough sensitivity to feel that there's something very special there. So it's, uh, now Mr. Cunningham, that's an interesting story, because he is a, you know, the Buddhist holy sites disappeared from, from awareness for hundreds of years. Since the Muslim invasion in India, the Buddhist holy sites, no one knew where they were. And here you have this Englishman who's reading the diaries of a Chinese pilgrim. And he's determined to find the four Buddhist holy sites. Now that's a bit weird, actually. And uh, so <laughs> on one level, it's a bit weird. On another level, it's interesting and something must be going on. So Ajahn Anand has, as, we, as I mentioned, certain capacities of reflection which are rare. And he said to me once, he says, it's possible, he sometimes uses that word, that, that Cunningham was the reincarnation of that Chinese pilgrim. Now why would that Chinese pilgrim be re reborn in England? Precisely because England was a colonial power, and uh, Mr. Cunningham, being an army general, had access to the resources of the armies. And there was the Theosophist 
society in England, which was really interest, beginning to get interested in Asian religions. So you've got this uh, powerful Commonwealth power being very rich and very powerful, and uh, rich and powerful enough to start reflecting <laughs> rather than just conquering. And uh, so they have this kind of uh, theosophical society and people are wondering what it's all about. And so Mr. Cunningham, with the support of the British government, was able to use the military and the powers of the military to find those four homicides. Now, what makes me think that Ajahn Nunn was onto something there it was as Mr. Cunningham himself that replanted poetry from a, a fallen uh, law, and there's like the sad things coming up. And he, 133 years ago, replanted two sad things which became the, the tree we were sitting under this morning and the one under the pink. So to me, that suggests a very special karma, doesn't it? That you're planting the body tree back where the body tree should be, and another one, just in case. But he was the British Army, Army Jeffers. Interesting. But what he did was he reopened the pilgrimage path, which uh, thousands and thousands of people have benefited from. So I would assume, is it Tuan San? What do you say in Cantonese or Mandarin? That these different ways of saying his name. Okay. So Ajahn Anam was suggesting that Tuan San was the past life of Mr. Cunningham. And that Mr. Cunningham patiently endured childhood in England. He was very precise. He was so precise. Here, he did. Like, why would he be so familiar with that? How would he be so accurate in reading that? He was, he was so precise that he there was a sort of map. Huh? Yeah. He, he could tell it here. But the thing is, if you wrote the diary, yeah. it, would, it, would, it would be familiar, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. 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 So I think there's something mm. to that. And we owe, a, we owe a thank you to Mr. Cunningham yes. for, uh, for doing that.